Um, recently, we've had uh, a lot of conversation about COVID-19 variants. Uh, can you please tell us what we mean by a variant and how these variants differ from the original virus? You know, with the variant, uh, as we know, uh, virus by itself, uh, we are talking about the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which causes COVID-19, the disease. Uh, by nature, viruses uh, go through mutation, uh, which is a change in the genetic material. Uh, and that many times may not affect the character of the virus itself, but sometimes uh, what it does, it, it affects its character in the form of maybe transmission of the virus, uh, the way it causes disease, the severity of the disease, uh, effectiveness of treatment, right? Uh, in the form of treatment, then we also talk about, say, whether how good a vaccine works against it or not. So all different characters, characteristics of the virus can be changed by the mutations of this. And when it causes a significant change, then it becomes a variant of concern. And so uh, currently we are talking about the uh, Delta variant, which was uh, initially discovered in India uh, in around April. Uh, which is now the dominant form in uh, Europe and uh, seen now in the United States. Yeah, thank you so much for that um, uh, introduction to the variants. We know how well uh, the public health measures and how well the vaccines would work against these new variants, uh, the alpha variant that we've talked about and the delta variant that we talked about. Yeah, uh, so yeah, critical, important here. Yeah. And uh, the one thing that they can all do wherever we are, uh, as you noticed, uh, as, as you noted, uh, you know, the wearing mask, being clean away from public, those things should not affect what variant it is. Those are things we can do to uh, decrease transmission. Now, regarding the other aspects, the vaccine and the treatments, most of our information currently, uh, clinical evidence comes from uh, United Kingdom, where it has been circulating as the uh, major variant for a uh, number of weeks now. So what they have uh, shown in a series of their reports is that, uh, yes, the vaccines work and they work really well, not as much as against the alpha variant, uh, the one that initially came from the UK, but it definitely works. Uh, they have suggested that compared to people who are not vaccinated, even a one dose of vaccine is more helpful. But to get a good response, you should get both doses, the full sequence, right? Both doses of the vaccine, definitely helpful. With the Pfizer vaccine, they've shown it's up to 88%. Another critical point here is reducing, even if you do get infected with the virus, the severe disease part is prevented. So like compared to those who are not vaccinated, hospitalization is 75% less in those who have got one dose and 94% less who got two doses. So vaccination does work great. Uh, the concern is that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the way it spreads, it seems that maybe this is quite more transmissible uh, than the uh, alpha variant. So that, that is a concern. Yes, no, thank you so much. And uh, you know, definitely it is reassuring that um, in countries like United Kingdom, where the Delta virus is already the predominant virus, it seems like the vaccines are holding up pre pretty good. So that is another reason to make sure that people do get vaccinated because it does look that the vaccines that we have available right now do provide um, uh, good protection. And I think it's important to put these um, side effects in perspective, like you said, that um, uh, with Johnson & Johnson, uh, the, uh, the US government uh, you know, put a pause on the vaccine to make sure when some of these cases of clotting popped up, but when um, they were sure that this uh, uh, the incidence is very low, like you said, a few cases in a million, they felt like that the benefit far exceeded the risk. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine was associated with a, a higher likelihood, although extremely rare, of having a clot. And that's why the CDC posted 
for a few days to really study this. And they found that this is an extremely rare event, more commonly happening in women. Um, so therefore, th there is a precaution in terms of whenever a female patient who is young wants to get Johnson & Johnson, I give her that information that although this is extremely unlikely to occur to her, um, it, you know, it, it is something that has been found in the order of one case per one million. So extremely, extremely rare, but it does happen. And also we're fortunate in the United States to really have a choice. And currently the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, there's just a lot more data on the mRNA vaccines because we've been giving lots of it, but also we started with those vaccines back in mid-December. So there's a lot more research, there's a lot more data, and there's a lot more doses on the mRNA vaccines, that is Pfizer and Moderna. So we have less, we know less about Johnson & Johnson, but they're all very safe vaccines. Uh, there have been um, some uh, reports of myocarditis and pericarditis that has been seen in young adults and adolescents after the Pfizer and I think uh, some cases of Moderna vaccination. So have you had any updates on that? Because I know some uh, uh, parents especially are concerned about that. Uh, myocarditis is an inflammation of one of the layers of the heart and it could be caused by many things, including some viruses. Um, early on, I would say about a few weeks ago, we started to see a very slight trend of cases after vaccination with one of the mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna. In looking at all the data, we, uh, we actually saw that although the Pfizer and Moderna tend to raise your risk very, very slightly uh, across, you know, when you compare the risk, your risk of having this condition in the general population, and when you compare that to the risk of having this condition after the vaccination, the rates are pretty similar, but there was a slight uptick after the vaccination. Now, we've seen that the cases, the majority of the cases tend to be mild and more importantly, tend to be reversible. So folks recover, folks recover from this. This has been seen mainly in teenagers, young, young people, and that's true for myocarditis in general. Myocarditis, that inflammation of, of that middle layer of the heart is more common in, in, in folks who are young. So it's not surprising that this is also more common in that population. So although there is an uptick, we also know that actual COVID infection uh, is associated with, with a much greater risk of cardiac complications. So in a way, the, the equation here, the balance is I have a vaccine that's extremely efficacious, safe, that very rarely, very infrequently can cause this inflammation of the heart. But then I have a virus that has killed 600,000 Americans, right? And given so many more cases of cardiac conditions to our you know, citizens. So you have to kind of weigh that in. So I would say most of us, I'm not a, I'm not a parent, but what I can say uh, in talking to a lot of my colleagues who are parents, they, the equation is pretty easy for them. This is an extremely rare complication. And very importantly, these have been reversible cases, the vast majority of, of them. So, um, to me, it's all about risk and benefit. And clearly for me, I, com I continue to encourage and recommend vaccination for all of us. There have been many myths, especially on uh, social media, uh, about the connection of uh, infertility with the COVID uh, vaccine. Um, are these concerns, are there any kind of validity to these concerns? And how do you reassure your, parent, uh, your patients who might have these concerns? So this is a great question um, regarding this myth of infertility being associated with um, the mRNA vaccines in particular. 
I want to assure you that there has been no data to support this claim regarding the potential for any of the vaccines to cause infertility. Um, this uh, notion, this fear um, originated from a false claim um, that was spread, um, suggesting that the spike protein um, is uh, similar to a protein on the placenta. And the idea was that if you became vaccinated, that maybe you would cause your body to form an immune response against the placenta and harm a future pregnancy. So that fact um, is, that is not a fact, it is a myth um, that's not true. Um, the vaccines, all of them are processed at the site of injection and they would not be expected to cause any type of um, hormonal change that would impact your fertility. But I think that the best data that we have to show that this is not true is that during the clinical trials themselves, the phase three clinical trials, a number of women uh, became pregnant. Um, and there were pregnancies that occurred both in women who received the actual vaccine and in women who received the placebo. Um, so we know that uh, there is not, there was not an impact on fertility that was different in those two groups. Um, so I think, um, you know, from I, when I counsel my patients who are um, interested in having a child um, and who also uh, are interested in the vaccine, I reassure them that there should be no issue there. You know, recently FDA approved the Pfizer vaccine for children who are 12 years and older. Uh, and many children in our community have actually already gotten the vaccine. Uh, some parents do question that since the disease is not severe in kids, why get the vaccine? Uh, even though COVID-19 disease have, has been milder in kids, more than 4 million children and more than 300 deaths have um, uh, happened because of the COVID-19 infection in children in just US alone. So, um, and many kids have been hospitalized um, and had been treated in the intensive care unit. Uh, there've been uh, kids who had needed artificial ventilation. So certainly COVID-19 infection in children, even though it is mild, it's not a benign disease. And so for these reasons, um, as a pediatrician, many of my colleagues and I strongly recommend any child who is 12 years and older to get the vaccine. It is true that the vast majority of children with COVID infection have mild infection, but there are significant complications that have been reported, as you said, um, in, in a number of children. And I think the, the most important thing to me is that by vaccinating children, you're not only protecting them, but you're also protecting their families. You're protecting um, older individuals and in their families, people with cancer and other medical conditions who, as we, we know, may or may not respond as well to the vaccine. Um, and we're just protecting our community. So, um, you know, even if uh, the, the child's actual risk of severe COVID is, is low. Um, I think that the vaccination uh, is really, has a much greater effect um, than just on that child. So I want to ask you what your recommendation is for people who want to travel overseas and want to visit family and friends back home? Great question. So the the vaccines, as we've discussed, are very effective um, and they, they do protect you, um, but they are not perfect. Um, and you can still become infected with COVID uh, despite having been vaccinated um, due to a variant or otherwise. My recommendation would be to avoid travel if possible to areas of high transmission until transmission has come down significantly and or until that area has a significantly increased rate of vaccination. And I, I completely understand the desire to see family um, and to travel. And I think that every person has to make their own individual decision on the risk that they're willing to take. And certainly we're very fortunate to have so much access to vaccine here. And it's, um, you know, certainly having been vaccinated, it protects you on some level, but I would still avoid traveling to areas where transmission is very high. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think what I would add to that is that if travel is necessary, make sure that um, you're fully vaccinated, which means 
at least two weeks after getting your second dose of Moderna or Pfizer or two weeks after getting your single dose of uh, Johnson & Johnson so that you have that uh, advantage of uh, full protection or at least um, you know, 95% protection that you get from Pfizer and Moderna. If you get two doses or a full course of a vaccine in another country, is that good enough? Or when you come to the um, United States, should you get one of the vaccines here? And uh, I believe what the CDC recommendation right now is that um, if the vaccine that you got overseas is approved by WHO, so uh, then you're good, you're well protected because WHO has, uh, uh, has closely looked at those vaccines and deemed them effective. And uh, that include um, at this point, the, the, uh, the Chinese vaccines, which are uh, uh, the Sinopharm, the Sinovac, and um, uh, also the AstraZeneca vaccines, in addition to, of course, the Pfizer and the Moderna and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. But if you received a vaccine overseas, which is not a WHO approved vaccine, then it is advisable that once you get to the United States, you do get the vaccine, which is available here. And um, uh, Dr. Uh, Sadiagi, would you like to say a few words about that? I, I completely agree with your assessment. Uh, it's, it's, it's the same understanding. I'm not aware of requirements of the United States for vaccination before coming to the US. There is a testing requirement, and by the way, that person, if they're infected with COVID, will have a positive test, so it's the same test. So even if you have variants, those tests will be positive. Uh, so there's no requirement for vaccination that I'm aware of before you come to the U.S., because honestly, it's impractical to really ask for that when many countries, most countries, don't have enough vaccine. I am very worried about other areas in the country with low vaccination rates. Um, and this is exactly what we're seeing. We are now only seeing patients in the hospital with COVID who are unvaccinated. It's become an unvaccinated problem, right? So we continue to see patients hospitalized with COVID. And they all have that in common, no vaccination, right? Or incomplete vaccination. I also got vaccinated and I had side effects. I was kind of ill for 36 hours, but then it went away. So don't let the side effects that people talk about discourage you from getting vaccinated. Right. I think we're very lucky uh, that um, we were able to get uh, such effective vaccines in such record time and, um, and these uh, vaccines, uh, they look like they work against all the variants of concern. And so um, uh, that, that is our best um, uh, line of defense. And that is um, a way out of this uh, pandemic.